Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name is Jason Newland and this is Let Me Bore You to Sleep Please only listen to this every single day, forever and ever now, Only listen to this when you can safely close your eyes now that's me tapping a book I don't know if I told you did I mention to you that I have a punch bag got a punch bag the other day I was thinking it was Thursday so it's now Monday. I think it was Thursday that I got it. And I think my friend helped me to put it up on Friday. Or was it Saturday? I think it was Friday evening. I say he helped me put it up. He put it up and I watched so and I held the punch bag up for him when he connected it to the rack it's got a lovely rack it attaches to the wall I like a nice rack it's, it's I like one that fits properly because with a punch bag if you've got the when I say the rack that it attaches to you have to have a nice one that fits Securely to the wall because in this case the punch bag is really heavy because you can get a heavy bag, you can get a light bag. Um, that's kind of the most obvious thing to say, I suppose. But when I was what 13 14, my dad had a conservatory at the bottom of the garden which he used as an office, but he only used part of it as an office and the other part he had because he was an electrician so he had like stuff stored in there and that but there was a lot of space so he put a uh, not so much a rack but uh, like a squivel screw thing into the into the ceiling which a punch bag could be attached to and it swiveled around and stuff. And I bought a punch bag, like a, a normal punch bag. But he also got a kit bag, which was like an old army bag. And he filled it with, um, I'm not sure which was which. I think the kit bag might have been the heavy one and we filled it with sand. And the punch bag I got didn't have anything in it, and I filled it with like rags and stuff. So one was light, one was heavy. Again, I'm not sure which was which, but I had two, two punch bags. One was light, one was heavy. One had like rags in. It was, it was compressed, so I didn't kind of lose my hand in it. It wasn't just really uh, so light that it just blow around in the wind um, you didn't have to keep the windows closed in case it blew around and fell off um, but you know it was heavy but not heavy just firm but cause it's nice to be able to just play around with a light bag but with a heavy bag if you want to you can do both on both really you can't do really heavy punches on a light bag but you can do light punches on a heavy bag. Um, but sometimes it's nice to have a little bit of... To do something a little bit different, you know. And now I've got... It's a heavy bag. But it's... As I said, it's got a nice rack. That's uh, attached to the wall. And I, this the rack's been screwed... Uh, with one, two, three screws um, like two at the top and one at the bottom there's like a bar going across 
there's another bar underneath that attaches to it um, like a little T-shaped kind of thing from the side and then the punch bag attaches to the thing after if you've obviously after it's been attached to the wall it's a little bit wonky because unfortunately the bag is a lot better quality than the rack that it's attached to so the bag is proper quality it's everlast and it's a proper boxing bag and it's you know it's good it's good good material and stuff I've had quite a few punch bags over the years but this the rack is it's a little bit squeaky and but it's okay, I just it's just fun, it's really fun to have it. So I've got it on the side of the wall. And the thing is if I punch it too hard from the front it bangs against the wall. And I've got a lot of soundproofing material on the wall, so it doesn't like bang against the wall directly. But I'm gonna have to get myself a big bit of foam to put on the wall in front of it so when it hits the wall it doesn't Sort of make too much noise and doesn't like shake the building or anything. But previously to this, I've been buying the stand up punch bags, the ones that um, before I moved here I had one. Why I didn't bring it here, I've got no idea, but why did this cost me 200 pounds and I just left it there? Anyway, it's it had it basically just looks like a punch bag. It's about six foot tall, and it's got a or maybe it's not actually it's probably about five foot like punch bag size, but it's on a a spring thing, and then there's a big uh, the bottom bit is plastic, really thick plastic which you can fill with water or you can fill it with sand it's probably better to fill it with like sand or something like that if you're indoors I imagine but it's pretty it's pretty good now, I've had two of them uh, again I left it at my other place back in 2000 and what year was that yeah beginning of 2011 I left my other punch bag that I'd had for a couple of years, I left that in the garden. Um, so yeah, I've had a few punch bags. So this time, instead of getting one that stands up, because it shakes, and it'll shake the, it'll shake the floor, and I didn't want to do that. Before it was okay, because it was outside, and the other one was inside, but I was on the ground. I was in a basement, so I wasn't shaking the floor for anyone. And I'm quite light on my feet, so it's it's better to have one that's supported by a nice rack. Um, but I also got a a swivel thing like for the ceiling. I bought a separate thing, which cost me twenty odd pound, which because I originally was going to have it in the ceiling, but it's hard to know where to put it but I don't know I might get another punch bag and put one in the bedroom I don't know we'll see also I'd like to get one of those speed balls as well because I just like I like punching just not like it in a violent way I just like the something I've always liked since I was a kid I liked that kind of exercise it's just fun it's good and it kind of it stretches your body I've noticed since I've had the punch bag that I'm not really doing a lot of hard punches more just playing around with it but I've noticed that I've been stretching my lower back the left side of my lower back which I've had problems with for years now and I'm, I can feel it stretched I can feel it's been stretched and um, it feels a lot better. It actually feels like 
it's kind of loosening up a bit, which is really good. And another thing I noticed that I didn't realise this before, which is weird considering the amount of bags I've had and the amount of different things I've done, like martial arts and things over the years. And I've always thought of myself as being just like orthodox boxer. If I was ever, I'm not a boxer, but if I ever was, I'd be leading with my left hand. But I noticed that actually, if I go unorthodox and I lead with my right hand, when I, I got quite a good left punch and that's really good for stretching my lower back on my left side. So I've been doing that quite a bit. I did it purposely to stretch my back. And I realised there's a bit of power there. So if I could get a little time machine and go back 30 years, um, probably 40 years even, I could, I might have been an okay little boxer. It's a little bit late now, but you know. That was one of my little dreams I always wanted to do. Another thing I wanted to do is, because I did karate, I did kickboxing first with a neighbor and then I did karate. And once I started doing karate, I fell in love with everything to do with martial arts. And I think that's standard for most people, especially like kids. And yeah, I became obsessed with everything, whether it's kendo, kung fu, wing chun, uh, judo. The only, that's one of the things I didn't ever want to do. I did go to a judo class once just to watch. And the problem I had with it was that I was little. And... And I know it's not about size. I realise that now. I didn't realise it at the time. But I just didn't feel comfortable or confident in my ability to like wrestle or to I don't know, it just didn't seem didn't grab my interest. I and mean, I felt confident with the punching and less so with the kicking, but I was, I was pretty fle- kind of flexible back then. A hell of a lot more than now. But I would never have wanted to go close up and try to wrestle with anybody because most of the people were bigger than me. Even some of the kids that were younger than me were bigger than me. But that didn't matter when you're punching and kicking. And so yeah, but I got really, really involved and loved it. And my dream, I wanted to be a boxer, but I wanted to be a bodybuilder. I did not have the body for it. Couldn't just, I didn't have an ounce of fat on my body. So even when I left school at 15, all the way up to pretty much Yeah, pretty much to the age of 25, my body was just, I was just really, really slim the whole time. And I had muscles, of course, I mean, everyone does, don't they? But I wanted to be big, I wanted to be like, look strong. It's okay being strong, but I wanted to look strong. Like, I never kind of had that wish come true. But, so the bodybuilding kind of just didn't it was like trying to be a basketball player I just didn't have the height so I know that if I'd have tried to join a basketball team I'd have been surrounded by people that were you know a foot taller than me if not more you know so it's just this wouldn't have been how do I've ever got the ball off them because all I've got to do is hold it at their head height and I won't be able to reach it so I didn't you know didn't do that 
I wanted to be a monkey boxer. I wanted to travel to Australia and learn how to do monkey boxing and go to a Shaolin temple. Well, it was not, I guess it wasn't a Shaolin temple because it was in Australia, but it was still a Kung Fu temple. But also I wanted to go to learn Shaolin Kung Fu as well. So that's what I wanted to do. That's, you know, before I left school, that was my dream. And I think at some point, you know, every waking moment of my life was seemed to be preoccupied with martial arts and watching every single martial arts movie there has ever been. And I actually, I used to buy the, um, a couple of martial arts magazines that were either weekly or monthly. And there was a man who taught praying mantis kung fu and he learnt it from, I think, going to China and he learnt it there and he was the only person in the UK to teach it. And he was Sifu, um, oh, was it Simon something? So he, he taught, he kind of basically introduced it to England. And he used to be in the magazine quite a lot. And I, I I used to read it and think, wow, this looks really good. And if you, watch, if you watch any of the old, like, kung fu films, a lot of, they'd have, like, praying mantis style and monkey style, dragon style, snake, snake fist style, and, you know, various drunken master style of kung fu. And praying mantis looks really cool. Well, here's the thing. I moved to Stratford in London, East London, when I was late teens, and I was walking down, I think it was the Romford Road, just past the library, on, I think it's on the left hand side, but it's not there anymore, but there was this building, big building. And it looked closed. It looked looked like a derelict building that hadn't got anything in it. But there was a sign saying "Pray and Mentis Kung Fu." So this is a days long before the internet. And as far as I'm aware, he didn't advertise because I used to buy the local paper, and I never saw adverts for it. So it's the kind of thing that you'd only hear about probably through word of mouth or um, maybe it was in the phone book, I don't know. Or if you passed and saw it, which is what I had, I saw this and I thought, praying mantis kung fu. But it didn't have any times, it didn't have any information, just the sign. So I went into this building and it was it was empty pretty much. But the door was open. So I walked in the door. I didn't expect to see lots of praying mantises running around. But, uh, but I walked through. Went up the stairs, I think it was. And there was... I looked through these doors. And there was this big room. Big, big, big room. And there was all these swords and this big display. All these swords and weapons on, on the... Various like butterfly knives and stuff like that on the, around the walls, and I think there was some punch bags and stuff, and these big long, um, kind of like not swords, but I suppose uh, spears and stuff like that. So I thought, ooh, this might be the right place. I knew it wasn't a it wasn't a takeout restaurant. I knew that. But, you know, it's, chances are it might be the right place. But I didn't, wasn't sure. But I kind of, there was a clue, I suppose. Plus, it did have a sign that says, uh, Praying Mantis Kung Fu. 
So I went in, and there was a man just sitting there. I think he was meditating. So I said, Oi, Oi, get up. <laughs> no, I didn't. Um, and he, he stood up, looked at me, stood up, walked over to me, and said, Right, right. I said, Yeah. And he was, he wasn't very tall, probably my height, maybe, maybe a little bit taller, maybe a little bit shorter, I don't know, but wasn't very tall but he was very muscly and you know fit and he had blonde hair he wasn't wasn't very old either he probably probably late 20s perhaps and I said to him I just saw your sign outside he said yeah we didn't say yeah but he said yeah And the rest of this conversation I'm going to make up because I can't remember what. But it kind of basically, I said to him, I know you. He said, do you? I said, yeah. Are you the person that was in the magazines? Did you brought um, this style of Kung Fu to England and stuff? He said, yeah, that's me. I was like, wow. I said I didn't realise you was in Stratford I said this because in those days before the Olympic Games in 2012 there weren't a lot happening in Stratford you know this it yeah it was it was busy but it was just you know there wasn't it wasn't a glamorous place not that it'll ever be glamorous probably but I mean, it's, I'm sure it's lovely but you know I did visit it after the Olympic Games and there's a lot of changes in the area around the stadium where they built it you know the uh, I mean the actual main stadium for the Olympic Games is now the home for West Ham United football ground but all that area the the shopping centre is it Westerfields I forget but I've not not been in there but you know that was all built kind of in preparation for it was just basically a huge money injection into that area but if you walk far enough away in any direction you end up in exactly the same as what it used to be the roads are the same the houses are the same you know it's it's kind of the same but just the area is different that area that around the bus station and the train station and that started getting transformed years and years and years ago long before the Olympics were even mentioned the train station started transforming Uh, they transformed the bus station made it all lovely and and they were going to have the train link I don't know if they do but they, they started the train connection from the Euro tunnel to come through to Stratford and that whole area around where the stadium is or was and you know the whole basic uh, Olympic village that whole area used to be waste ground which had used to be the docks used to be where all the trains used to come through and uh I used to walk through there and it was massive and I remember walking through because it was like a shortcut to get to the train station from where I used to work and instead of walking around I just walked through it it's a big old area and I remember saying to my friends saying why don't they do something with this? This is a lot of space. Why don't they? Why don't they have an Olympics or something? No, I didn't. Um, I 
I said to the, there was just there was loads and loads of broken down trains that were just rusty and it was just a massive area that used to be really busy like probably 50 years ago or something anyway I remember the they started working on it all and they spent years putting it together and it's quite cool what they've done and that road leading from Stratford to Mile End the part before the underpass the Bow underpass the there's like hotels now and stuff like that it's you know they've put a lot of effort and work into that area but move away from it and you're back it's like going back in time to 30 years ago which is kind of quite cool as well it's quite nice to revisit old roads and areas that I used to live in and it's the same it's the same so possibly even the same people live in there although a lot of people I know I know at least one person but probably imagine thousands of people in Stratford they sold their house and made a nice profit and then moved somewhere nice to live somewhere where they probably got a lot more for their money I know someone that bought I think they bought a council house for like £14,000 in the 80s or maybe early 90s or something and then that house what was it one, two, three bedrooms plus an extension plus a garden that would have sold for probably easily 500000 maybe 400 grand but at least I reckon more probably half a million so with half a million you can't get much in London in most places but if you move to somewhere like here where I am or if you move to some other parts of the country you could buy a huge house and still have £200,000 left to spend so it's, it's just it's down to kind of I suppose how attached you are to the area I suppose, I don't know but anyway I wasn't going to talk about Stratford oh yeah so what I did is I spoke to this man I, f- I want to google it I feel like I want to want to google it because to put his name in Sifu which is I think it's that means teacher uh, or Sifu S-I-F-U I'm sure his name is Simon something anyway had this place and I went along he said we'll come along we're open I think he was open quite a few nights a week because from the looks of it it wasn't being used for anything else because it was his he clearly rented it or whatever unless he owned it I don't know so he had this and I went along and did a bit of learned a bit of praying mantis kung fu now I don't know why but I didn't I liked it but I think because I was more into the comedy I was more into busy doing gigs and going to comedy clubs as well as working all day that I kind of put my energy into that rather than doing the Kung Fu and I, I, I do regret it because it would have been a brilliant thing to have really got good at 
that, that particular style. And I remember we were doing some stuff and uh, I got hit and bruised because there's a lot of um, conditioning when it, in Kung Fu. And so there's a fair bit of bruising happens, especially with like blocking punches and stuff. And this is something I've never experienced before or since. We went and st- went upstairs. It's like this, uh, like a balcony, a few steps up. And I was put in. I suppose I was getting dressed or whatever. And then I come out, and they were all sitting there drinking something, or drinking like tea out of these like Chinese cups. I I know they're Chinese because one of them spoke to me. <laughs> no. I, I, they look like Chinese, China, Chinese, I don't know. Um, but it's, basically he'd made this um, potion up. I say potion, it's probably not the right word, but it was, it had alcohol in it, but it was um, roots and ginseng and various kinds of things. And he said, uh, he did put it onto a thing and he said put this onto the bruise and I think he said I think it's the first time I learnt it is if you bruise yourself a good thing to do is actually press into the bruise as you press your fingers into the bruise and that kind of evens it out and it actually reduces the swelling and it reduces the pain Anyway, he put this, he did that, and he put this stuff on my arm or wherever it was, my hand. And he said, that would be good for the bruising. And then he said, drink this. This will be very good for healing. So it's kind of like a, I suppose like a Chinese tea that he'd made himself, though. Because he'd spent years living in China. I was like, wow. So just you know it's one of those things that I wish I you know, kind of stayed involved in because he was so cool and I was quite awestruck when I met him because I'd already sort of read about him because he was uh, well known in the martial arts world so being this young man that had spent I don't know, maybe seven years or whatever in China, learning, maybe longer, learning this martial arts, speak, learning to speak Chinese, learning, you know, to be a master of the technique of praying mantis, kung fu. But I didn't go back, and then one day I did go back, and it was closed, and then they knocked the building down. I hope he managed to get out and I hope he wasn't meditating <laughs> and, but what was strange because that was like in the early 90s probably and then and when I say early I'm talking like 91, 92 and then in 2001, I think it was, 2001, in the summer, there was, I walked past this, just the normal way I was walked past, and there's this alleyway that I always walk past, and there was just a bunch of shops and stuff, and I saw a sign, praying mantis kung fu. And I thought, mm-hmm. so I went down there again, went there, and it was him. And he'd moved; to, he'd got a new place. I don't know where he'd been before then. He'd probably moved around a couple of times, maybe. And he rented out this. Again, it wasn't as big as the old place, but it's still a good size room. Um, so I went along with my cousin and 
I sweated so much. I remember that because I felt I looked like I'd just got out of the bath. Because I hadn't really done much exercise for a couple of years. So I was a little bit, probably, yeah, got a little bit overweight. And and then not long after that, I moved out of London. So I didn't kind of get to sort of really get into it. Did, uh, so I always found that thought I want to do Kung Fu I've done Karate and I did boxing I did about I spent about a year or a year and a half going to the boxing club back in 2009 probably and I lost quite a bit of weight doing that and that was good but back in 2004 I started going to a martial arts a, a kung fu club Wing Chun that was run by Master Wong and he, he was a character prop, very funny like it's Chinese is fairly short, bald, but so funny. And he just, he lived the life. He really knew what he was doing. And, but he was cheeky and it's very funny. But anyway, I did that for over a year. But I kept getting injured. So, because it's, it's very full on contact especially with the blocking we just stand there and have to block punches and end up I'd end up like bruising all of my arm and my hands and my shins my knees and there was one point where we were elbowing each other in the chest with pads on with like body armour but somehow so I managed the person I was with managed to actually because the body armour was shaped in a certain way he managed to get underneath the body armour just missed the body armour and hit my rib and I ended up with a broken rib so that was not great so I couldn't do anything for I don't know six weeks or something I, could, I went and trained a little bit after a while I was able to go in and just do a bit of punch bag work maybe like a bit of kicking and stuff and I was there doing that and I wish I wish 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 that I'd had a video camera taping it because then I could have put it on YouTube when YouTube decided to exist because it didn't at that time so basically there was this big room that we were in it's like a big hall really high ceilings and off the ceiling there was this punch bag in the corner and it was basically hanging off this big long chain it was a heavy bag and I was kicking it and I gave it a good old kick and it it broke off and it, the, the bag went flying now Realistically, I know it wasn't me. You know, I'm I'm not, I'm not a superhuman kicker. But oh, wow, that would have looked good. If I'd have had that filmed, it would have looked like I'd. Well, that was me that kicked it, and it did break while I was kicking it. But it it would have looked like I'd kind of kicked it really hard. The reality is. A small child could have probably walked up to it and just pushed it and it might have fell off because I guess the the hinges were loose or something but it felt good it really did it was 
cool. But as well as learning Wing Chun, I also learned some uh, Jeet Kune Do, which is what Bruce Lee created. And that was fun as well. So it's kind of did Wing Chun twice a week, then did Jeet Kune Do, I think, once a week. So Tuesday and Thursday was, or was it Monday and Wednesday? I think it might have been Wing Chun. And then maybe Tuesday was Jeet Kune Do. And then on Friday, it was Leg Spa, where we all used to get together and weren't allowed to use your hands at all, not even to block. So basically, um, leg kicking, but blocking with your legs, and that was it, the whole, the whole thing. And you just go from one person to the next, and it was knackering. But the good thing about it is, if you do it enough, you start getting quite good at kicking, I suppose. And that was the last time I was any good at kicking. Not that I was good, but I was okay at it. But we'd all be padded up as well. It wasn't. It wasn't like I think we were. Probably had a. Yeah, probably had like a body pad. Body pad. That sounds like a something you see on an advert. Isn't it? Body pad. Very comfortable. Try body pad. You can now go skating again. It's, yeah, I think they did, I'm not sure. I might lose track, but that was really cool. I like doing that. And then, as I said, I did the boxing. So in, when I moved to this town, I did, what did I do? I did boxing for a while and then in 2011 I started going to Taekwondo and I did that for a couple of years I did three was it three or four gradings I forget at least three gradings I still got certificates and I got first class like top grade passes on those Andre's just decided to come out and go to the toilet. That's lovely. Hello, Andre. So I went to this Taekwondo and it's it is more focused on kicking than punching, which isn't really my... I can't kick high anymore. You know, I'm kind of more like stomach level kicking. So, but they had quite a few adults there that weren't, well, just equally like my level of flexibility. Some of them were older and it, they were still managed to be black belts. So it didn't seem to really matter about being someone that could kick really high and you know, head high and stuff, which surprised me and that encouraged me as well, because the man that was teaching was in his fifties, and he started probably like at my age that I was at that time. So I didn't have the excuse of like I'm too old because he said, "Well, I was older than you when I started." Plus, I wasn't coming in without having any experience of doing anything because I've done did various martial arts over the years. So I had a little bit of memory of you know blocking and movement and avoiding and you know stuff like that. So, I sat in the first time, I think. Or no, I didn't I actually, 
I, I was allowed to join, you know, I joined in the first time I was concerned it would be just full of kids and because the last time I did karate I was a kid and it was full of kids when I went to boxing there was there was a few adults but there was a lot of kids there so I prefer it to be adults you know but it was it was very much probably 50-50 but then the kids were, most of the kids were older there was a few young ones but and the adults varied in age from being you know in their 20s to being in their 40s so that was quite good in fact there was a couple that were in their 50s I think so there's a really um, nice atmosphere there so I used to go there on I think it was a Tuesday and a Thursday or it might be a Monday and a Wednesday I forget but I went there for I said quite quite a while and I did at least three gradings to get belts and might have done a fourth one I'm not sure because my last grading involved sparring and that was I think that might have been green belt But I was, I, was, I was nervous. I was nervous doing that stuff. Especially with so many people at the grade in all kind of, and they all watch. Because when I was a kid, when I did the karate and had the gradings, there was a lot of people, but there was not that many people. You know, it was, it was a much smaller um, event because I was in a smaller area. Because where I live now, it's a big, big old area. So I did that and uh, eventually I had to stop doing it because of my lower back. My lower back, on the left side of my lo- the left side of my lower back, due to just wear and tear, is I just couldn't do the kicking anymore. So I have to stop doing it. Which was a bit, a bit sad. So I haven't done anything like that. I haven't done any... Because I lost weight again when I was doing that. You know, exercise. And it's pretty full on exercise for... You know, twice a week for like an hour and a half or whatever. But it's a good, to get a good old sweat on. I used to sweat... <laughs> I do sweat when I exercise. I was like, sweat. To be honest, it's like one of those puppets, you know, where this sweat just squirts out of the head. It's, uh, which is a good thing because it's toxins and stuff in the skin gets released, doesn't it? So it's it's got to be a good thing. I remember years ago this person that I. I dated, it was a, a nurse, or a former nurse, and she, uh, she was saying to me, only unhealthy people sweat when they run, or when they exercise, which is absolute rubbish, absolutely, it's like, okay, so every boxer, every boxer in the gym, every boxer that's in a boxing ring, that's sweating, they're unhealthy, yeah. Yeah, it's like every runner in the Olympics that's sweating, they're unhealthy. It's just, it's just trying to say that the fact that because I sweat, I must be that I'm unhealthy. No, I've always sweated when I've done exercise because I, I like to put a lot into it, you know. I like to, if I'm doing something like a movement or if I'm running around or, you know the just like I just like to do it properly I like to put everything into it 
So if I sweat, I like to sweat properly. I try and get all of the liquid out of my body. Just let it get all of it come out. Let all the, the sweat that's been built up. I don't know if sweat builds up, but... I even I think one thing that really makes me sweat. I don't know why I'm talking about sweating. When I do the vacuuming. Now I think that's always happened to me, and it possibly happens to a lot of people, because it produces heat, doesn't it? The the vacuum cleaner. But whenever I do the vacuum cleaner, I notice it more now because I wear glasses, and the sweat falls off of my forehead or my face. I'm looking down at the carpet and the sweat drips onto the glasses and everything becomes distorted it's really weird but at the same time it feels quite nice because it feels kind of like a cleansing like a I would say like a a bat a baptism from inside but that wouldn't be right but just like a like the skin just cleanses itself and yeah I like that although saunas I'm not big on saunas there's something about I don't know not really I think if I had a sauna for myself and it was just me I'll probably be alright but I wouldn't really want to be in a sauna with someone else unless I knew them like really well yeah it's this this very it's like being in a sauna is like talking to someone in fog or smog you know it's like I'm talking to someone but I don't know what they're doing you know it's like mm. it's just like I can't see you but I'm talking to you are you really there or if you just left your phone there and now you're on the bus and you're talking through another phone and you're just like trying to fool me mind you that involved buying two phones so that'd be a bit expensive prank So I'm not mad about saunas and the whole thing of having a sauna and then jumping into an ice pool. Uh, yeah, not so much. Not really. No. What I do like though, it's nice in the summer. It's been a while, and when I say a while, I mean a long, long time. But when I was a kid, um, in the summer, I used to sort of go down to the beach with my brothers, and we'd. There used to be this. What was it like? A big water pool thing where they'd have boats where you could rent a boat out not a boat but like a little paddling boat thing and you could like rent it out and you know pedal around for 10 minutes or whatever and then they'd call your number in so people used to sort of dip their feet in the water and um, me and my brothers would have water pistols and we'd use them and hit each other with them no pistol whip each other no we'd spray water at each other and stuff but then it got to the point it was so hot and I don't know some somehow one of my brothers would appear with a bucket out of nowhere like where was he where was he hiding it I don't know he didn't have it when we left the house I wonder if he was walking so weird but you know he'd pull a bucket out of nowhere and it would uh, fill it with water and start like chucking the water over each other and the water was always it's never hot it's never sort of cold even though the water was cold 
because it was so hot because back in them days the summers were really hot really hot you know um, back in what year was that probably probably 19 we could be anything from 1979 1980 81 82 83 84 85 they were all hot hot summers the really hot summers were like the proper scorching scorching summers would have been 75 76 77 and I remember those even though I was little I remember just how hot those summers were but it never stopped us going out because those were the days when I used to go out with my brothers or my friends and we'd just be out all day and I would get completely burnt to a crisp because my skin doesn't take the sun it's just I've never been able to absorb sunshine just my face isn't too bad but then my face goes red but it goes red in the winter and my arms can just about manage it but the rest of my body I, I have to keep covered I think I might just bash the microphone sorry about that and apparently the weather forecast was saying the other day oh it's going to be it's going to be the hottest summer in the whole of the history and it wasn't it wasn't at all compared to what it used to be I, mean, I remember years and years and years ago probably what year 1990 let's say 1994 I reckon probably and I was standing maybe 95 but I was standing inside a phone box again this is before mobile phones were really around um, I think the mobile phones in 94 were the size of backpacks and I didn't get my first mobile phone till I think 97 at the end of the year Or maybe 98 the beginning of 98 I don't know but anyway I had I remember standing in the phone box talking to my friend for probably about a half an hour maybe longer and I was soaked through it was I suppose it was like being in a sauna but it was so hot outside and I suppose I guess really phone box would turn into a greenhouse because tomatoes started growing out of my underpants so yeah it was like really hot really really hot and I was sweating so much Ugh. but it was nice it was just I don't know there's something quite nice about I didn't realise until I started talking about sweating that I like it so much. It's a bit weird, isn't it, really? Ah, oh, there you go. So that's some that's some more boring stories about my life. My Kung Fu days. I think I'd like to... I'd like, since I've had the punch bag for the last few days, I've found myself remembering the Wing Chun style of like punching so I'm thinking I think it'd be quite nice to maybe look and see if there's a Wing Chun club Wing Chun Kung Fu club that's like not too far away 
maybe try and go there just once and see what it's like and it might be something because it's a bit more gentle it's not gentle but I think it's that's not the right word but Wing Chun was created by a woman to defend against men so it was created in mind for pretty much anybody to use without that person having to be some big strong muscly huge man and it sounds a little bit sexist but you know the fact is it was created by a woman and it was created for that reason so they could defend themselves so that for ladies and men also learnt it and continued with that so it's something that people that may be they don't have to be strong to use it necessarily it's about speed it's about um, little blasts of punches and yeah oh, another thing I did I did uh, what was it called oh, my uncle's a black belt in it he's a, he's a teacher um, Jiu Jitsu I went to a, I had a martial arts club just up the road from where I lived years ago and I went to a Jiu Jitsu club not it was in the martial arts club but it was a Jiu Jitsu classes and I went for a few weeks but the bloke just wanted to hurt me just every time a new person started they wouldn't come back because he just kept hurting them like throwing us all over the place you know grabbing my wrists my fingers twisting them and I'll be honest it was too painful I gave up because I didn't like it because I didn't like the pain and he was just a bit too rough I think and he enjoyed it in fact it wasn't just he enjoyed it he told me he enjoyed it he liked hurting people like that's oh another martial another thing I did was Krav Kav Krampa or Krav Gampa or something it's called and it's the Israel martial arts and it's a real no nonsense one where it's it's really, really vicious and I went there I think once or twice but it was hard to get there and back in the evenings but with the instructor I had half an ear ripped off because he'd been training and this they grab each other's ears and it's just what surprised me is it was full of the class was full and there was lots of women there there was lots of you had to be I think 16 or 18 to attend but you'd think it was like a yoga class or something because everyone's all fit and happy and like they're about to learn this kind of style of fighting which was gruesome really ugh. so I didn't manage to go anymore because it was hard to get home from but the reality is I was probably just scared <laughs> I was scared no I wasn't but so I managed to bore you hopefully with another bunch of pointless stories of my kung fu days where I didn't I suppose I did learn some stuff did each one for a while but 
do you like having a punch bag? I was very pleased with that punch bag. So I'm going to go. Just to remind you, if you are still awake, I do do sleep sessions, which are very much more... I was going to say sleep orientated, but I do like a deep sleep whisper hypnosis podcast. I do a weekly sleep hypnosis weekly podcast. As well as this, I also got a relax relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety, and panic attacks podcast, which is also popular as well. So if you are listening still, hopefully you're not ill or fast asleep because I bored you with way too much information about absolutely nothing that you're interested in. Because being boring isn't necessarily about talking about boring things. It's just about talking about something that you're not interested in. So... You know, it's astronomy is not boring to someone that loves astronomy. But for someone that's got no interest in it, it might be the most boring thing to listen to in the world. Because we're all different, aren't we? So, I wish you well. Remember to be kind to yourself. Remember that you deserve to be loved. And... I will speak to you next time. Bye.